this is a series of six, of six webinars that we're doing to ensure crop pollination in U.S. specialty crops. Sponsored by Bee Health, the Extension Site, and the Integrated Crop Pollination Project. And uh, we're real excited to, to be able to do this because it get, we had already, this will, be, we, this will be our fourth webinar. We've had one on almonds, one on high bush blueberries, one on apples and cherries. And now we get to talk about uh, watermelon pollination. I'm sure that's something that everybody's interested in. So um, without further ado, I'll let um, Katarina introduce our speaker of the day. Thanks uh, so much, John. So um, we are uh, really excited to have uh, Dr. Neil Williams to present on watermelon pollinators and wildflower plantings for bees. Neil is an associate professor in the Department of Entomology and Nematology at UC Davis and has over 17 years of experience studying crop pollination and farm management practices to support crop pollinators in California's Central Valley, in Pennsylvania, and in New Jersey. Um, he's going to be running through his um, entire presentation today and then taking questions at the end of his presentation um, and we'll give you all a heads up when that is happening. Okay thank you Katarina. Thanks uh, to John as well and to Mark who I can't see but um, I, I want to uh, spend the next 30 minutes talking to you in the webinar about on-farm pollinator habitat benefits for watermelon pollination. Um, this is a webinar, again, that's part of a USDA NIFA funded especially crop research initiative uh, grant. Um, and this is, um, I want to also acknowledge, this is a, a, a large CAPS grant, a collaborative grant between a number of different institutions. You can see them listed here. It's important to point out the lead is uh, Michigan State University. And we also have received a lot of support and valued input from um, different stakeholder groups that form our advisory board um, and just uh, coordinators throughout there. Uh, so let me get started the way that uh, I will talk today in the uh, webinar. So a little bit first about what integrated crop pollination is. So integrate, integrated crop pollination, which you can, if you're interested, you can link to here at the uh, Project ICP uh, website, um, although I think that, that that link might be incorrect now that I'm looking at it, but um, involves uh, basically the combined use of multiple pollinator species, habitat uh, augmentation here, and uh, uh, different horticultural practices as a way to uh, uh, improve the reliability and economic uh, pollination of specialty crops in the U.S. And today I'm gonna to focus really on um, these habitat enhancements, this petal of the diagram, and also focus a little bit on the value of uh, managed and alternative bees for watermelon uh, pollination. So it'll be a little bit different, more focused on the establishment and habitat part than the previous talk. So I'll start by, uh, uh, in three parts. The first talking about the role of wild bees and honeybees in watermelon pollination. I'll then move on and talk about the impact of pollinator habitat uh, for bees and pollination in the watermelon context. And then close by talking a bit about what we've learned about uh, ways to establish habitat and maintain that habitat to benefit pollinators and pollination in the watermelon and indeed in the row crop system more generally. Okay, so it's important to recognize, um, again, this project looks at especially crop pollination looking at crops that are highly pollinator dependent, and watermelon is a great example of that. Watermelon in California is grown for both fresh market and seed production, and it's a very highly pollinator dependent crop, primarily depends on bees. Uh, watermelon uh, and the cucurbit, the vine seeds in general, have separate male flowers and female flowers, so they require a bee, uh, could be other pollinators, but mostly bees, to transfer pollen from the male flowers to female flowers. Um, and the, the plant itself, the same vine, can have both male and female flowers. Um, and that results then, this little baby watermelon here, uh, turns into the, the fruit uh, that is then harvested. I also wanna point out that um, 
the question may arise, well, what about seedless watermelon? And the truth is that uh, seedless watermelon uh, requires uh, pollination too. So we need pollen transfer in order to set seedless watermelon. And in fact, it needs to be cross-pollination often from a one variety to another. And so this need for uh, reliable pollination is just as great, if not greater, in seedless watermelon production. The contributing species uh, to, to watermelon pollination, the different bees, uh, vary, and it depends on um, the landscape context and the type of farm on which the watermelon is grown. So we see contributions both from honeybees and from wild bees. Um, honeybees are particularly dominant in terms of pollinators of watermelon. You can see this photo here of a, a large watermelon field in California. Um, and at those large farms that are within relatively intensive agricultural landscapes, pollination is dominated by visits uh, from honeybees. There are wild bees present and they do make a contribution. The importance of those wild bees, again, and their, their strong role is context dependent. And so where we see wild bees providing a particularly uh, d uh, strong role is in um, smaller farms, often smaller acreages that are in less intensively managed landscapes, although not exclusively. And indeed, in our work on small farms, we find that native bees like this little bee here on a female water watermelon flower are sufficient by themselves to provide all the pollination needs uh, for watermelon without the input of honeybees. Um, in addition to differences in which bees dominate in terms of visitation, there also are differences in the effectiveness of wild bees and uh, managed honeybees in the pollination of watermelon. This is true across other specialty crops as well. And so what this figure shows you is pollination measured in terms of pollen grains deposited uh, during visits to watermelon flowers. And it shows that for different groups of bees, bumblebees, uh, sweat bees, uh, burrowing bees, which tend to be reasonably large bees, but uh, maybe the size of honeybees or so, but build their nests in the ground. And then way over here on the right, um, honeybees. And what you'll see, I think really what I, the, the take home message here is that there's, there's variability in the contribution or the effectiveness that different bees uh, have on watermelon pollination, and that honeybees are not a particular standout. They're in fact in the lower uh, range of effectiveness in terms of pollen deposited during visits to watermelon, they become important because of their large numbers um, uh, of visits. Um, pollen deposition is uh, critical for fruit yield in watermelon, and that is true both in the context of seed production and in fresh watermelon, uh, fresh market production of watermelon. Um, the first panel here shows the relationship between uh, pollen grains deposited on the flower and the number of seeds that are in watermelon fruits and that would ultimately contribute to total seed production. And basically more pollen deposited equals more seeds per fruit and you can see a positive relationship. Um, in terms of marketable watermelon, uh, it is also true then that there's a positive relationship between the number of seeds that a watermelon has or the level of pollination and the resulting watermelon weight, so that as uh, seeds increase, yield of watermelon goes up as well. And again, um, this is well known across a variety of a, ver a variety of different specialty crops: apples, blueberries, strawberries, etc. That there are these relationships. In addition to um, the number of pollen grains deposited, in terms of watermelon production, um, this figure just shows. Uh, some people measuring watermelon weight and density in the field, we know that uh, more even and temporally consistent pollination, that's the, where visitation is reliable over space and time in the field, leads to a higher fruit density. So if we have more, uh, more massive fruits, higher weight per fruit, and higher density of fruit, we end up with a higher yield in the field overall. Um, so that's sort of an overview of the importance of, of wild bees and honeybees in terms of their role in pollination of watermelon. I want to move on for the, for the bulk of the talk to look at the role that 
habitat for bees uh, plays in the pollination of watermelon and the supporting of that diversity of bees, which we see important to watermelon pollination. And I'll start with a little bit of background, which I call um, the irony of intensive agriculture and pollination. So this photograph shows an aerial flyover image of part of the Central Valley of California where agriculture production is quite intensive, but this is not uncommon in this region and is true elsewhere as well. Um, the irony arises because these intensive landscapes, and particularly in areas like California, which have large numbers of specialty crops that are pollinator dependent, there is the high, there is very high demand for pollination in these areas because they have many, many flowers that need to be pollinated. It is in these same areas, though, where um, there's loss of natural habitat and other native, uh, negative inputs that challenge bees, both populations of wild bees and of managed bees. So the spots where we most need reliable pollination present some of the greatest challenges to supporting the bees that provide that pollination. Um, so with the loss of habitat, um, this lack of sufficient resources for bees over time, foraging resources, prevents, presents one of the primary challenges that we see, essentially landscapes that do not have flower resources. And so our goal is part of Project ICP in terms of augmenting habitat is to add back in floral resources as part of the farmed landscape composition to support those pollinators. And indeed a leading strategy in North America and elsewhere in the world to support bees within farmscapes is the planting of habitat, whether it be wildflowers as we see in this photograph or um, hedgerows and wildflowers combined in other contexts. So I'm gonna move on and talk a little bit about that, that process and what, it, uh, what its impacts are for bees and uh, pollination. So um, generally, like I said, we, in these intensive landscapes, we suffer from a lack of sufficient forage for bees. And so um, the goals of planting habitat, like you see in these pictures, are to provide forage for honeybees, and for wild bees to support a diversity of wild bee species that provide pollination. Particularly, we are looking for a combination of plants that provide reliable pollen and nectar sources, and also hopefully um, places for bees to nest in the landscape. That is not so important for managed honeybees, but for other bees, for the wild bees, um, where there's a lot of tillage, these areas that are set aside may provide important refuges for nesting that supports populations that then can be uh, involved in the pollination of the crop that is adjacent to the planting. When we're planting habitat, we're looking for a combination of attributes that we're using to select the plants that we, that we plant. And this plant selection is a common challenge or question that we have in all such, sorts, uh, such plantings. We need to provide habitat that supports continuous bloom throughout the flight season of those bees. If there are gaps in the available resources for bees, those bees will not be able to persist. In California or elsewhere, it is the goal of many of our partners and also um, our group in general to try and use native plants to California where possible. Those tend to be locally adapted and do well in the areas that we're growing them. In particular, in California, where we're in a semi-arid environment, we're looking for plants that are drought tolerant. Growers are most interested to be irrigating their crops, not to be irrigating the wildflower plantings. So we try to spare the water for use in crop production and choose plants that can survive without that extra water. We want plants, of course, that are preferred by bees. And increasingly, we're looking at mixtures of wildflowers and shrubs although the use of wildflowers versus shrubs will depend on the context, um, the type of farm that we're looking at. So I'm gonna tell you next about some of the goal or some of the uh, outcomes of actually the sorts of plantings you see here in these pictures and what they have for supporting increased floral availability for bees and increased uh, uh, bee abundance that results. So this figure here shows a typical planting um, kind of in a field margin with crop fields on either side. 
and the panel, the, the figures are just comparing control margins, which do not have any wildflowers planted, to enhanced margins, which are planted with wildflowers. The first panel shows the difference in floral density, um, and you see strong increases in floral density with the enhancement, and also significant increases in the number of flower species that are available. We also see increases in the abundance of bees, uh, numbers of bees, and in the diversity. So in floral density, we see a threefold increase in the flower resources available compared to controls, and we see a sixfold increase um, in the native bee abundance that is there. These plantings also have uh, benefits for honeybees, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. I wanna first talk just a little bit about their role in supporting uh, nesting density for wild bees as well. So we have surveyed nests, and this shows a picture here on the panel on the right of wild bee nests that look not unlike sort of an anthill, but a little bit uh, simpler with just a single entrance hole into the nest, which is under the soil. The habitats that we plant with wildflowers significantly increase the nesting density and bee richness compared to borders that are managed um, according to standard practice. So here are the control borders are in gray and the wildflower enhanced borders are in orange. And with nest density and bee species richness, we see significant increases in both of those um, as a result of the habitat enhancement. Again, these habitats not only support uh, wild bees, which are an important part of the integrated uh, crop pollination strategy, but they also support managed honeybees. And so this just shows a summary of some of our data from plantings looking at the number of honeybees that we find uh, visiting our wildflower plantings. And so it's comparable to the wild bee support that we see um, throughout the season. These habitat plantings provide important resources for honeybees that are in those areas. I want to now talk, I'll just show you some information on the value of these plantings for the crop pollination and yield itself. So we've been able to show very clearly that there are benefits of the habitat planting for the bees themselves. And we know that the presence of those bees leads to increased pollen deposition um, in watermelon in different kinds of trials. But we've also looked directly where we've established large plantings adjacent to watermelon fields to look at the impact of those plantings directly on watermelon yield in um, those different fields. And so what this uh, figure shows you, again, um, the axis here is adjusted for different varieties of watermelon that were studied, but it's the same setup where the gray is where there are no, wild, uh, no wildflowers present and the orange where wildflowers are present. And this shows the density of watermelons at different distances from that margin into the crop field. So at zero, at 10, 25, 40, and 80 meters in. And we see at all those, different, at all those distances, we see substantial increases um, in the melon density. Um, and particularly, it's important that that increase persists into uh, the field quite a, a long ways into the field. Whether that is due to um, wild bees or honeybee visits, um, I don't have the information today, but it could be both. And so the idea here is that the integrated crop pollination strategy is not about one type of bee or another, but about the combination together. So I wanna move now from talking about the benefits for watermelon uh, plant pollination and for wild bee uh, uh, supporting bees and wild bees and honeybees. And I wanna uh, spend the rest of the time talking about how we implement these plantings. And so no matter what the question is, what seed mix we might use, there are some general rules that we've learned from our work. And I wanna tell you some about those experiences and how we're translating them into best management practices. And this will be from our experience primarily with wildflower plantings, although we are starting to look more at hedgerows in different contexts as well. And so um, the decisions that we make on implementation uh, depend on site considerations. How much space and time is available to the grower? Does the grower have irrigation? 
uh, what is the context that's existing there now, and that would pertain to weed pressure that might exist, and what are the available management practices for the grower to establish. And so I want to talk about a, diff uh, a set of different uh, types of establishment. I'll talk about site preparation, particularly this uh, vexing problem of weed control over time, and then about establishment in, um, in terms of timing over the season, and conclude with some about maintenance. So I'll first talk about one strategy that we can use in California where we have long days with lots of solar energy um, and warm temperatures, and this is using solarization. We have found that solarization is very effective for weed management. It's effective whether there's conventional management or organic management, and it can be used in both situations. Um, what we use, this shows, these pictures show the steps. We use um, uh, tillage of the site followed by uh, or disking here in the first year and what we then do is irrigate the site at the very warmest time of the year so we would uh, disk the site in early summer so that we had the site prepped and then irrigate it before the first of July we would then cover that site that had been irrigated where we're going to establish with uh, UV resistant plastic that's available. It's a clear plastic, not a black plastic. We use two to four mil thickness. This is then buried to seal in the moisture. It essentially uh, uh, establishes a little greenhouse that will cook the top several inches of soil and sterilize that soil, killing weed seed um, in the process. We can then sow the seed in the fall of the year, you see the timeline here below, and are beginning to get um, the benefits of bloom at the beginning of what we call the second year. This is the first year of, um, that we would have the planting in place. So it's a fall, it's a summer disking and solarizing, a fall seeding, and a spring to summer uh, bloom over the next several years. I wanna emphasize that once we till and irrigate, when we take the plastic off to sow, sow the seed, we do not retill the ground. We might use just scratching of the surface, but tilling will disturb that uh, sterilized surface layer and just introduce weed seed back up into the top surface and all the efforts of solarization, or most of it, will be lost. So no tilling after that first disking in any case. That will become a common theme as you'll, as you'll see. If we are not using solarization, we can use herbicide prep. And here, the main thing is um, that that preparation in these two timelines just needs to happen even further in advance. So if we're looking for an establishment to be effective in what I'll call the third year, we need to start ideally two years in advance with disking in the summer, followed by rounds of irrigation and chemical burn down or spray um, sequentially over time so that we're killing off weeds that are associated with fall, winter, and spring weeds to get a clean uh, seed bed to sow into in the fall of the second year. And from then, um, we proceed uh, with planting and then bloom, just as we did in the solarization. The lowest time frame is, it, is if the context is one where there's quite extreme weed pressure, we need to back up and start even further in advance. And this preparation in advance is probably, um, in addition to the tilling issue, is the single greatest uh, challenge that we face in trying to engage growers in effective planting of habitat. There needs to be site prep in advance. Cutting the corners leads to very weedy plantings and a lot of extra work and often a potential failure if it isn't done properly. I wanna emphasize again that there is no tilling after that first till, right? So, we disk and then through all these rounds of spraying and burn down with chemical tools or with solarization in the previous slide, we do not till the seed bed again. Okay, we wanna be making sure also that we're using non-selective herbicides and non-persistent herbicides. Okay, the fall seeding process follows a variety of different strategies depending on the size of the planting. We can use handheld seeders, belly grinders, drop seeders of various sizes. Even um, uh, drills can be used in order to do that, so drop seeding or drilling. 
Again, the important issue here is we do not till in preparation for seeding. That is because these seeds do not need to be buried anyway. Um, they do, they're native seeds that are dropped by their plants on top of the surface. So we are just pressing them into the ground, perhaps with a light ring rolling after seeding, but there is no tilling that is going in. The maintenance of those sites over time then will involve a variety of different practices depending on the level of uh, weed pressure. We can use spot spraying, selective herbicides against grasses, which we uh, are challenged by here. Um, depending on the location, in some parts of the country, we might be using mowing, uh, but in California, it's, it's very localized. Hand weeding and hoeing, uh, flame weeding. We want to uh, limit the irrigation because irrigation will tilt the balance in favor of weeds. Remember, we're using drought tolerant native plants that do well with low water. There also can be problems with herbivory um, and those may or may not be possible to control depending on the site. Okay, so that will help us get establishment in that first year and get a clean, uh, well-established planting. Long-term maintenance, again, continues to follow spot spraying or hand weeding. Uh, again, limiting irrigation or removing it entirely. Certainly with wildflowers, we've been able to do this with no irrigation of the plots at all. Um, there can be mowing or burning, selective herbiciding, and if needed, we can come in in subsequent falls um, and reseed over the top again with no tilling. So that's pretty much how uh, we go about the process of establishment. Um, and I, I will close my talk there. I think I've used up my 30 minutes. And um, I'll just leave you with some resources. There are a number of good, win good ones. We've partnered with, um, obviously, with Project ICP. Um, here's the correct website, icpbees.org. I'll correct that on the slide earlier. That has a variety of tools avail uh, uh, available for growers. The Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation has very good regional plant species lists for these plantings, as well as guidelines for implementation. And then more detailed information can be find, found at a variety of places, but the um, wetland restoration uh, in Willamette Valley um, has, a, has a website with lots of detail. And it, we hope that we, you can also look at our uh, information at UC Davis, which will link you to some of these other ones. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to um, finish up the presentation and uh, I'll defer to, uh, to Katarina to tell me what um, is the next thing to do. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Neil, for a really great presentation. So we have a, a good amount of time for uh, some questions. Um, so if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. Hopefully there won't be any diff technical difficulties with that. And shall um, I stop sharing my screen? Uh, you can keep sharing it. That's fine. I'm not sure um, I see a Q&A box. So. Oh, uh, I'll uh, ask you the questions out loud. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Great. So, um, so actually, um, <clears throat> one of the first questions, um, you talked about how both honeybees and native bees use these wildflower plantings. So right. the question is, is, does that end up causing uh, competition between the crop and the wildflower planting? Will yeah. growers have concern about meeting their pollination needs? Yeah, that's a, a really, a really a very important question. And I, um, I didn't have a slide on it, but we have just recently had a paper accepted that looks at that question in detail within the almond context. And we've uh, looked at it there and in a couple other places. Um, and what we find is that there does not appear to be uh, uh, measurable competition between the wildflower plantings and those orchards. And I think the reason is when the crop, especially crop itself is in bloom, the density of bloom is very, very high and the crop is quite large compared to the planting that we have. And so it, it tends to attract those bees. Uh, and so we see the, the planting augmenting that benefit um, rather than competing. And of course, once the crop is finished, then the planting continues and we find um, that benefit. If that was a concern, um, there would be uh, techniques that could be used, maybe um, 
a high mow that would take back the flowering for, for, for during bloom, it would reflush depending on where the planting is. But, but we have not found a competition in our work. Great. Um, we have a, a couple of questions coming up, and I, I just want to apologize uh, if people can hear banging in the background. <laughs> uh, the lab next door is, uh, I think, creating some kind of antics enclosures. <laughs> um, I might step away from the computer for a second to ask them to stop hammering. Uh, hopefully it's not too distracting. Um, uh, so Vincent Kramer asks, can growers reduce the number of honeybee colonies per acre when habitat is present without reducing yield or quality? Great question. So we know from studies um, that look across gradients of the amount of habitat that is naturally in the farm landscape that that would be true for sure. So in landscapes in our work from Pennsylvania and from California, we find that in the case of watermelon, where there are uh, reasonably uh, large amounts of natural habitat or moderate amounts of natural habitat, the wild bees themselves can provide um, sufficient pollination. Um, that would mean that the honeybees could be reduced and in fact growers in those areas, it's certainly true in California where I am, they already uh, do not use honeybees in those types of contexts because they're aware that they're getting sufficient pollination. Um, we have not, um, as part of the ICP project at this point, convinced or worked with growers to ask them to experimentally reduce the stocking densities of honeybees on those crops and see what the implication would be. It is certainly a logical next step that we should go to, but that takes some uh, very high-risk behavior on the part of the growers, or at least perceived high-risk. So um, we, it's something we need to work towards. But certainly the data exists in in the kind of natural experiment. And do you think, just a quick follow-up on that, because um, I know you've done some work looking at watermelon pollination on the East Coast. Yeah. Do you think the story is different on the East Coast in terms of um, uh, could growers reduce or remove honeybee colonies and not have an, uh, an effect on yield or quality? Well, we've also done that uh, work in California actually earlier than we did it in Pennsylvania and okay. New Jersey. It's just a slightly different context. And again, on those farms that were nested closest to natural habitat that were smaller farms, we found a similar pattern um, where wild bees were sufficient to provide for pollination. Um, we don't have quite the same completeness of information in all contexts, but, but the same pattern is likely to hold. Great. So um, we have another uh, um, crop or crop related question, and this is coming from Oliviero. And um, they ask, uh, is there uh, only one flowering season of watermelon in California or is it blooming all year long? Really good question. Um, that it, the answer is it's blooming for quite a, a long time of the growing season in California, we have watermelon fields that were blooming anywhere from the first week of June, sometimes earlier, but certainly first week of June for fresh market production, all the way through to uh, flowering beginning in the middle of August, because there'll still be enough uh, degree days to, uh, to uh, ripen that fruit into September and maybe even October. Um, so the season is long. Any one planting doesn't last that long, but growers use staggered plantings um, and rotate it around to different places to achieve a longer growing season. So our plantings, part of the reason they're designed the way they are, and I didn't have uh, details of that, but they are designed to flower for an extended period of time and offer resources to the bees throughout that whole growing season. Great. So we um, have a question from Jerry Jarvis asking if there is a commercially available seed mix um, for wildflower seeds mm. uh, suitable for the Davis area and where could it be purchased? So I'm assuming Jeffrey is based in Yolo County. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I should probably let Katarina answer that question. She's been more involved in the outreach side of some of the work for ICP. Um, there are seed mixes the at least that the guidelines are are well available my understanding and i'll let her correct me is that there are some uh, regional seed producers um sns seeds that has wildflower mixes that can be purchased there are nrcs uh recommended mixes that can also be purchased and i would say if you have a particular application if you're in northern california certainly the davis region 
I would encourage you to reach out to our group and see whether you could even tailor them more specifically if you wanted, depending on uh, what your goals were. I didn't show them in my webinar, but we have some fairly sophisticated seed selection tools that we're developing um, that can be used to kind of streamline the, the design of those seed mixes. And um, Neil, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you've worked with Hedro Farms. Uh, yeah, here Hedro in Farms, which is now part of SNS Seed, okay. um, in, just outside of Esparto, California, um, is one who we've worked with. But there are other places that have um, their pollinator mixes. We have not had funded projects that, say, test the attractiveness or performance of different commercially available seeds. It's something that would be very interesting to do and, um, you know, a future, future goal, I guess. Great. Um, we have Brian asking about the color of the solarization plastic. He asks, mm -hmm. why clear plastic for solarization instead of black? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. It's because of the, what we're trying to do with the plastic in this context. So we use black, black plastic will warm the soil to a, a certain extent. It also provides a light barrier, which prevents um, weed growth throughout the season. Our goal here is really one of sterilization. And so it's a kind of like a steam sterilization. So by irrigating that soil to six to eight inches, uh, let's go with eight inches of moisture, and then immediately covering with uh, clear plastic, we create essentially a solar greenhouse that's right up against the ground. And we get temperatures that are really surprisingly hot and will kill um, the seed, the weed seed within the top few inches of soil. Um, and so that's why we use it. it. The black plastic will actually not get quite as hot as that. So it's allowing solar energy into the surface and trapping the heat. Great. Um, we also have someone asking, Vincent is asking the following question. What is the relationship between distance to the native habitat and pollination benefit in the crop? Does it have to be really close by? Yeah, um, I wish I could give you a really detailed answer on exactly how far it can be. Um, I, can, I can give you a more general answer. So we know that bees of different sizes will fly different distances as part of their normal foraging. And so it's very important that the uh, planting be within the normal flight range of a particular bee. A bee like a honeybee or a bumblebee will have quite a, a far distance that it will fly regularly. Several um, hundred yards would not be, you know, outside the ordinary or, or even even further. A thousand yards even could be uh, for in some cases. Uh, for smaller bees, that may be, you know, a dozen yards or so. And so we we generally try to place them in within the farm context as close as we can. It's important to recognize that the available land that a grower or a landowner might have may not coincide perfectly with that desire. And so, um, so people do plant them, you know, several hundred yards away. And I think those, without any doubt, will be supporting bees in the general farm landscape and will provide a benefit. But perhaps not um, quite the same extent as if we can get it right adjust adjacent to planting. But really, the practicality will trump um, uh, will trump you know the, the the best of possible situations. So, I agree with that. <laughs> um, great. Uh, another question is: um, Have you looked at all at how um, other kinds of insects are responding to these plantings? So you talked a lot about how native bees and honeybees respond, but what about other pollinators and even pests and natural enemies? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question, too. So certainly we've looked at other pollinators. So we have data both on surfid flies, the, these uh, bee mimic flies that, that are important in pollination of some crops. We've definitely looked at butterflies as well, and um, our mixes do support them. I had one slide kind of midway through that showed the number of visits, at least of those different groups in a pooled sort of a way. And, and so, yes, indeed. And we also know that different plant species within the mixes are differentially attractive. What we're engaged in right now in terms of research, um, we're working with uh, Cal Department of Food and Ag um, and some other partners to look at the role that those plantings play in supporting other beneficial insects. So uh, for biological control, the natural enemies of key, especially crop pests, and also whether those plantings might actually support uh, key, especially crop pests. And we would like those plantings to, if nothing else, at least be pest neutral. So they're no worse than business as usual border plantings. Um, 
and I can't uh, share you with you final data today, but that's ongoing, and, and we should have things being uh, coming out on that within the year for sure. I mean, a, a summary is that there are can be slight increases in some uh, kinds of potential pests, not necessarily the, the worst pests, but big increases also in some of the natural enemies. And so the net effect may be a, a positive overall. Great. And then one last quick question. Do you know the cost uh, for the rent of beehives on watermelon farms here in this area? Yeah. Um, I, I, I would be guessing uh, like what's in my mind. So I, I think I will pass on that question, but I know it, one, one reality is that it varies quite a bit. So there are some growers who might have uh, a relationship with, uh, with beekeepers that can get quite a low, are paying quite a low price, you know, maybe $35 or something like that per hive, as opposed to what is, you know, many times that in almond. Um, others, uh, I don't know, but that's a number that comes to mind. I would, I would point you towards the um, resources through uh, the state extension apiculturalist or the uh, California State Beekeepers, which will have information on those. Um, Great. Great. Elena, Elena may know that answer. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Neil, for answering all those questions and for a really great presentation. Um, we're hitting uh, the end of the hour now, so we're going to wrap it up. Um, I'm going to post two things and then pass it over to John uh, for thank yous and reminders about the next uh, webinar. So I'm going to post in the chat box right now a link to a um, uh, a Google form where if you are looking for certified crop advisor credit, you need to click on that link that's appearing in your chat box and fill out the information there if you want to get your credits um, for participating in this um, webinar today. And um, as John is talking, I'm going to go ahead and um, run, actually I'll wait till John till you're finished to run the last poll. Um, and thanks again, Neil. You're welcome. Yeah, this won't take long. I just want to thank everybody for your patience and putting up with a little technical difficulties to start with. I think uh, what I said to start with it would be well worth your while, and I feel that it, that it has been. I'd like to encourage you to, if you're interested in this particular webinar or some of the others we've had, that we still have two more coming up. One on March 21st, ensuring pumpkin pollination, and then the following week, on March 28th, how to manage solitary orchard bees for crop pollination. I think these will be very informative and worthwhile for information for you and your crops and your ag systems. And I'd really like to thank Neil Williams for an excellent presentation today. Bravo. Thank you, John. And that's, that's all the comments I have. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, John. Thanks, Neil. And thanks again, everyone, for your patience today. I'm going to launch the last poll um, of the webinar. We're hoping that you'll take a few minutes to answer these uh, few questions to talk about, uh, tell us what you thought about um, uh, this webinar. And um, we'll be sending out um, uh, hopefully copies of the slides um, and then a link to the video. And for those of you that have been wondering, um, all of the webinars will be posted, the video for all of the webinars in this series will be posted on the Bee Extension, excuse me, Bee Health E Extension uh, um, YouTube page. Um, but we'll also be sending out those links to um, uh, everyone who registered uh, for uh, any of those webinars. So keep an eye out on your email uh, for those links. And thanks again to everyone for joining. Thanks again to Neil and John. And uh, um, I'll leave the poll open for a little bit longer, but uh, thank you all for coming. I'll, I'll close it in about a minute.